Uh, welcome back, everyone, to uh, this online NordSec edition. Again, thanks uh, for being part of this large-scale experiment. I hope you're having as much fun as we do uh, in the background. So uh, let's let me introduce you to the next speakers. Uh, it's a duo from uh, Cisco Talos, uh, Vitor Vitor Ventura and Paul Rascagnier. Vita, Vitor Ventura is a Cisco Talos security researcher. As a researcher, he investigated and published various articles on emerging threats. Most of the days, Vitor is hunting for threats, investigating them, reversing code, but also looking for the geopolitical and or economic context uh, that better suits them. Vitor has been a speaker in conferences like uh, Recon Bruxelles, Defcon Crypto Village, and uh, Besides Lisbon, among others. Prior to that, prior to that he has been the IBM X-Force Iris European Manager, where, where he was a lead responder on several high-profile organizations uh, affected by the WannaCry and NotPedia infections, helping to determine the extent of the damage and to define the recovery path. Before that, he did, a he did a penetration testing at IBM X-Force Red, where Vitor led flag flagship projects like connected car assessments and oil and gas ICS security assessments, custom mobile devices, among other IoT security projects. Vitor holds multiple security-related certifications like GREM, CISM, among others. Paul is a security, uh, well, no, to Paul. Paul is a security researcher within Talos, Cisco's threat intelligence and research organization. As a researcher, he performs uh, investigations to identify new threats and present his findings as publications and at, at international security conferences throughout the world. He has been involved in security research for seven years, mainly focusing on malware analysis, malware hunting, and more especially on advanced persistent threat campaigns and rootkit capabilities. He previously worked for several incident response, response team uh, within the private and public sector. He is also uh, uh, familiar uh, with the NordSec organization, multiple time speaker, if I remember correctly. So uh, let me introduce them uh, to further talk, uh, high speed fingerprinting, cloning, myth or reality. Hi, I hope it works for you. Yeah, just waiting for the slide. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, I think this introduction was was just perfect and and covered more or less everything. And yeah, I'm really happy to be here for the first uh, online edition of NoSec. So my name is Paul Raskania. I was a couple uh, speaker for a couple of time at uh, at this uh, conference. I'm very happy to be here. And yeah, I'm mainly interested on malware analysis and APT research. So I work on cases such as Olympic Destroyer, WannaCry, or, or, or whatever. And uh, I'm really into 3D printing. You maybe saw a few of my creation on my Twitter or, or whatever. And you will see it's really relevant for this talk where we will speak a lot about uh, 3D printing. Hi, um, I'm Vitor. Um, I, like, I like reverse engineering. I like malware. I'm located in Portugal, um, and yeah, let's dive into our, our talk today. Uh, it's my first time on, on this conference, by the way. So uh, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. So first we will start with the background. We'll talk about the state of the art of fingerprint authentication, then the different sensor types, and then we'll do a deep dive into our research. We'll define the threat models, our process, and we'll end up with the test and the wrap up. So talking a little bit about the state of the art. So uh, fingerprint authentication, it really started to be massively used when Apple introduced it on Touch ID back in 2013. And on that same year, it was already broken by at the, the CCC conference. Throughout the years, it was adopted more and more in several devices, laptops, mobile devices, uh, every kind of device. And our goal when we, did, we decided to do this kind of research was to see if this has evolved. So with the time and with the adoption, has security evolved on, on, on this kind of, of devices? So just while we were doing our we were doing our research, Samsung S10, the fingerprint authentication was defeated by a simple silicon cover. And at the time we thought, oh, maybe our research is, is completely destroyed. And then there was on another conference, um, 
uh, a team from X Lab that also did the same thing uh, on three different devices almost on the fly. But they didn't reveal any of their process. They didn't defil- reveal any of the details. And we th- at that time, we thought, OK, then we should really do this research and do as we think, like re- releasing all the details of our process. But at the same time, we wanted to make it as real as possible. That's why we defined the threat models. But we'll go into that in a further uh, ahead. So just before that, look, let's talk about the different sensors. There are three major kinds of sensors right now. There's the capacitive ones, which pretty much create a capacitor between our fingers and the sensor through the, the usage of the electricity in our, in our bodies. So when you have a ridge, that will create this, the capac- capacitator, which will be detected. And when we have a valley, a valley that won't be detected. So there are a second, uh, the, uh, second type of capacitive sensor, which is the active one. In this case, the principle is the same, but instead of using the natural electricity in the bodies, it will send a signal from the sensor through our skin and then back into the sensor. So it's, kind of, it's an active sensor, it's one because there's a signal being generated by the sensor itself. Then we have the optical ones. These, these actually were one of the first kind of sensors to be developed. In this case, as you can imagine, there's a light source that is uh, projected into our finger, and then there's an image sensor that will read the, the image from, from our finger. Um, likewise, the ultrasonic ones, they have the same principle. There's an, an emission. In this case, it's an ultrasonic pulse, which will then be detected by the sensor. Both of these sensors are actually, the need for these sensors actually uh, was increased when the full, uh, the full screen mobile devices came up because these two kinds of sensors, they can actually be put below the, the screen, the display. So you can have a borderless phone with it. That does not happen with the capacitive sensors unless you put this, the sensor on the back of the phone. So this is kind of the main reason why these two kinds of sensors were developed. Well, the, the ultrasonic one was developed and the, the optical one was bring back, was brought back to into the market. So now talking a little bit about our process. As I was saying, we wanted to have a, a real life model uh, of the research. So for that, we decided to define three different scenarios, threat scenarios. And to those scenarios, we have linked the collection methods. So the first collection method is the direct collection method. In this case, well, the, the, the finger is just put on a mold and is in, which is then used. And you can imagine like someone that is unconscious and they, someone just picks, picks its, finger, its finger and then put it on a mold. The second threat scenario is the fingerprint sensor, where the person just put the, the fingers on the sensor and the fingerprint is collected. And this, you can just relate with all the biometric leaks that has happened in the past with, um, with some companies where huge number of fingerprints were leaked and no one really knows where they, where they went. And the, the third method is a, a third party collection method where basically you have an object and you lift the fingerprint from that object. In this case, it would be more like a, a spy movie thing, but it's still a, a threat scenario. And it, it, it is important to have it here in order to establish a relationship between all the different threat scenarios. So it's our process is not just about the collection. Then we have another an, 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 two additional steps. One is the optimization. So once you collect the fingerprint, you actually need to optimize it and you need to, to work it so that you can actually then do the creation. And the creation is done through the creation of a mold, which is then filled with the materials that will actually do the, will create the fingerprint. And for that, I will leave you, I will pass you now to Paul that will explain this, all these details. Yeah. So let's speak about the, the collection and how we get uh, data to work on. So our, first case was direct collection so we get the uh, fingerprint directly uh, from from the finger in this case we decided to use plastilin which is a fake clay used by sculptor and that reacts to um, uh, heat so basically on the right you have a heat gun you put it on the plastilin it becomes soft and you can take um, uh, the fingerprint directly uh, directly on it and create a mold it was a easiest way no size issue we directly had from the finger and and it was really straightforward and easy to do the second approach is a collection 
from a sensor. So you can see here the sensor we use. So it's basically the cheapest sensor you can buy uh, on the internet. Uh, it's connected in USB. It uses serial protocol to, to get data and it's very really easy to use. On the right, you have the really bad application provided by the sensor. And uh, you can see a fingerprint captured with, uh, with this sensor. As you can see, the resolution of the picture is really bad. It's very, really, very really bad, but uh, I was surprised it was good enough. I had to make some tricks to, to optimize the picture, but uh, finally it was good enough to, to do our job. The third uh, approach we, we, we use to, to get uh, data is third-party connection. So like a movie, if you wish. On the left, you have a picture of uh, a fingerprint on a glass. And on the right, you have the same one, but I put some black powder to increase the contrast. Uh, I think on, on Twitch, maybe the resolution is not good enough, but uh, you can see picture on, on our blog. Uh, we will give you the URL later. Here, it's not my fingerprint. Uh, I don't want to leak my fingerprint on the internet, so I use the palm of my hand for this specific picture. And all the fingerprint you can see and you will see during the presentation are the fingerprint from Al Capone, directly from the FBI website and not my or Vitor fingerprint. Because, yeah, who knows? So once we have all this data, uh, data from the sensor data from uh, the camera, we need to optimize the picture. So as I mentioned, the resolution of uh, the sensor is not really good. So I had to take a couple of different images, put them together and create a, a big one. Uh, in fact, the, the square really where you have the sensor is too small for a big finger, like my big fingers. But, so I need to create a, a small square and put it together, increase contrast and make some Photoshop to have this kind of image you can see here from, from Hal Capone. Another optimization I had to do, uh, if we, I'm waiting for the next slide. Yeah, if we take the third party collection is I need to crop the picture. And I need to play a lot with Photoshop to increase contrast and have a clear line and clear, clear uh, black, white, and gray uh, picture. So it's simply a question of time and manipulating uh, photo uh, so, uh, software. Here is an example. So on the left, you have Al Capone fingerprint, black, white. And on the right, you have a 3D model of a mold of this fingerprint. So it's a negative because it's a mold, it's how it works. And uh, in, in this case, you can see it's, it's pretty similar and how it works. In fact, you have black line and uh, on 3D printing, we can use that as an alpha and the black is push the, the clay, virtual clay, digital clay. And, uh, and the white doesn't do anything. And after you have the different uh, level of gray that push more or less uh, the fake the digital clay. So you will see a video of, about how it works uh, exactly. So creation. Yeah, yeah, for the creation here, you can see the size of a mold. So the mold you can see uh, on the bottom is a fake fingerprint of Al Capone. And the other one is my fingerprint. So that's why they put in the uh, other direction. And I use a standard 3D printer, uh, something you can buy. Our budget was 2000 euro. Mm -hmm. So not a huge budget. We cannot buy a really crazy expensive printer, but yeah, that was an example of, of molds. And you can see it's, it's pretty small. <laughs> Yeah. So here is a video about how it works. So the software is named ZBrush. It's standard in the industry. And uh, you have the alpha, so the black and white picture. Uh, it's on the left. You will see it in a few seconds become bigger. Yeah. And I will use this alpha directly on the model. And the alpha will push the virtual clay inside and the fingerprint will appear on it. And it's basically how it works. If Twitch resolution is bad, you can check on, on our blog. You can see it. it. It's really, really easy. 
So that's how I create a, a fingerprint uh, mold. So let's speak about this, the, the printer. Uh, the printer I use is a 25 microns uh, resolution printer. Uh, it, it's not super expensive. It's less than two, 2,000 euros. And if you think about thermal fingerprint ridges, it's about 500 microns wide and 20, 50 microns deep. So the resolution of a standard uh, resin printer is, is pretty good. It's good enough. The other problem is the material used for casting, because once you have a mold, it, it's nice, it's beautiful, but you cannot do anything with the mold alone. You need to cast something and create the fingerprint. We will see we got a couple of issues with, uh, with that. And another big constraint is uh, 3D printing is not designed for micron. You know, it's designed to create a small object, but not like micron object. If we speak about a figurine, it's 10 centimeters, it's not so small. And ZBrush doesn't have a real world size uh, parameters. Mm -hmm. So you create something, it doesn't really have size, in fact. And in our case, we are speaking about microns. If the mold is few microns too big or too small, it doesn't work. The sensor will not recognize your finger because it's too big or too small. And something we discovered is the resin need to be cured. It's toxic when it goes out from the, the printer. It needs to be cured in a UV chamber. And we discovered that the UV chamber generates retraction. So not big retraction for a figurine you don't care, but uh, big enough to create molds too small or too uh, big for our context, uh, speaking about uh, fingerprint. So we had to spend a lot of time dealing with uh, this kind of issue because, uh, yeah, we had to be really careful about how many seconds we do curing, always do the same curing, the same number of molds in inside of the chamber, et cetera, et cetera. It was really, really time consuming to, to, to be really consistent and have always the same uh, process and the same size, et cetera. Some picture on the left, you have uh, seven molds directly from the printer. It's a small one, as you can see, but I can make seven molds uh, in the same time. On the right, it's simply the molds are taken from, from the bed. And here you can see on the right, you have normally, if it comes, Yes, yeah. On the right, you have the UV chamber. So uh, the circle in white turn and you have UV lamp and UV lamp have project on the mirror and it how resin is cured. And on the left, you have all my fail attempts. So all the mold you can see are too big, too small. I make some annotation on it to say, yeah, it's too small or it's too big or, or I was tired and I didn't do a negative, but a positive of my fingerprints, this kind of stuff. So I had to create more than 50 bad molds to have the final one, which is good, perfect size, and it works. So it's it's really time consuming when you 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 know how many uh, hours you need to print something. So, but yeah, when I want something, I spend time on it. <laughs> so, yeah, let's speak about the filling material. So when you have the mold, you need to fill material inside to create the object. Is that how it works? We use silicone, we use glue, etc. As uh, Vita mentioned, some sensors are conductive. So you need to have conductive stuff to enable the sensor and start the authentication. Silicone is not conductive. So if you do a fingerprint in silicone, it won't do anything on this kind of device. I We said, yeah, maybe we can mix silicone with graphite or aluminum, any kind of conductive powder, and it will work. So no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. And we had to find a, a really, really good material that allow to have the same conductivity than our skin, our body. And finally, we find a hack is to use textil, textile glue. So it was pure luck because I found this stuff on my children's home and I said, why not? Let's try it. We will see what happened. And if you create a really thin layer of uh, inside of the mold of fabric glue and it's thin enough to put a real finger behind, 
you will have the conductivity of your real finger. So it works if it's thin enough and you have a real finger uh, behind. So it cost us a lot of attempt to, to find it and it was purely by luck, but we can be lucky in life. And yeah, now let's speak about the tests we did, uh, the device we tested, etc. So I let Vitor speak about this part of, of the presentation. Okay, so we wanted to make sure that we would test the different kinds of sensors and the different kinds of devices and finally the different kinds of operating systems behind those devices. Because the way that fingerprint authentication works, it will uh, do the, co the comparison between the fingerprint and the template on different places of, of the stack, let's say like that. So let's see a movie about our tests. So if she, as you can see, Paul has a glove on, on, on this and it works because in this case, we are, talk, we are using the Samsung S10 and the, the sensor is a, an ultrasonic sensor. So there's no, there's no need for connectivity. On the other devices, it's more, they are using uh, active capacitive sensors. They need this. They, need, they actually need the real finger behind the, the, the fake fingerprint in order to have the, the, the conductivity. Yes. I, I, I want you to look at, at this device, for instance, as the padlock. And you should notice that there is a, a gray ring around it. There was the same thing around the iPhone. And this is actually the place where the signal comes into our finger to go back into the sensor, as I, as, as I mentioned before when I was talking about the, the, the sensors. So in the end, our results show that the direct collection method actually has the best results. And that really makes sense because we are taking the finger directly into the mold. And on one side, on one side, on one side, the, the, the mold is more perfect, but also we don't have the problems with the retraction and everything that Paul was talking about, because there's no retraction. We have the, the, the mold directly to be casted upon. Um, the other thing that you should notice is that pretty much every sensor that was defeated with the direct fingerprint collection was also defeated by the other methods with more or less success rate. Uh, if you notice, we never were able, we were never able to defeat the, the window, the, the laptops from based on windows and even on different brands. And we'll, we have more or less an explanation for that ahead. And, and the same thing happened with the both thumb drives. Uh, I also want to mention a special case about the Samsung S70, which um, A70, which we never broke, but at the same time, it doesn't really work very well when you are using the, 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 real, fi the real finger. So our guess is that, well, it's not something that, is, that should be considered as uh, a good example of being a, uh, good at, at, at using, the, using the fingerprint because in reality, it doesn't work that well, even on, on normal cases. So, and now the wrap up. So we wanted, when we decided to do this project, we wanted to put some parameters on it so that we were sure that this would lead to something which can be uh, related to real life. We don't want to make something that we are using a huge amount of money and then we can prove that someone can do it, but then it doesn't relate to real life. It doesn't relate to the threat profile of each person. So that's why we decided to have, okay, let's have, let's have a budget, which is under $2,000. Um, also the, 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 the limitation for direct collection, we didn't want to have any kind of limitation there because there's, there are different ways to do it. And we wanted to have some method which would almost be used like a baseline to all the others. On the limitation side, okay, we know we have talked about it. There's a problem with, with the scale, with the resolution. And we know that there, is, there have been some advances on this. Paul will talk about it later when we talk about the future work. And of, of course, there's the problem with the, the, the resin that can be retracted with the, with the UV while, while doing the curation process. So now about, about Windows and why did we had more difficulties? Well, in the end, the, this is a question of having, um, it's security versus commodity. So we unlock our phones several times a day. And if we go and we compare all the points, we'll have more false positives, false negatives, sorry. So we'll have more, more times where we put our finger and the reading is not correct. At the same time, on the laptop, that doesn't really happen that often. So our, our guess is that Windows is comparing more points of our fingers 
as related with the mobile with the mobile phones in order to have a better security but at the same time doesn't have such a big impact on usability as if that was uh, happen on the phones so it's a question of how many points in the simple terms it's a question of how many points are you comparing on the finger and uh, how much are you uh, concerned about usability and user experience and for the mitigations i will pass it to paul now yeah so let's speak about mitigation uh there is a, a few steps that uh, vendors can do about mitigation uh, if we look at the number of attempts if you take a uh, apple devices uh, you can only test your fingerprint five times. If it's failed five times, you need to enter the pin, no choice. Uh, if you check uh, Samsung devices, for example, it's 50 attempts. So you can try 50 times and uh, it won't ask you the pin until this 50 false attempt. You simply need to wait a few seconds between uh, five attempts, but it's uh, 30 seconds, I think, and you have five attempts, 30 seconds, five attempts. So it's you can do it. It's it's okay. -ish. And if you take another device, I tried more than 70 times and it doesn't ask me for the pin. So it's probably unlimited or it's 100 or whatever. I didn't spend my day trying to unlock uh, the device. And yeah, that's something that I think could be uh, improved by making less uh, attempts like Apple did, or maybe to put this stuff uh, to under the control of the users. Maybe you can decide it on, on parameters. I want five, 10 or whatever attempts before switching to the pin. It could be an approach. Uh, something else uh, vendor can do is to jump, if we jump on on uh, Vitor explanation on Windows system, uh, maybe we can propose to the users to uh, configure a number of points to be controlled and say, okay, I want a restrict device. Uh, I want to control a lot of points, and if it fails, I accept it. I will enter my PIN. And we can have some other users with other profiles that decide, okay, I, I don't really want to use my PIN, and I want to be really soft on the number of points I want to unlock my phone. So it, it can be some uh, mitigation and improvement that could be done by, by vendor. Yeah, if we look at the conclusion, we think uh, that fingerprint authentication is, is good enough for the majority of people. It's a question of threat model. If you are really worried and you are someone with, uh, I don't know, a journalist or, or some this kind of uh, sensitive profile, maybe, uh, and if you are afraid about secret agency or government or whatever, maybe it's not good enough. Maybe maybe it's not maybe they they should have the capacity to to clone a fingerprint without using a massive budget if you are worried about someone that's still your phone at the bar yeah it's good enough don't worry uh for one fingerprint for my finger spending time on it it cost me months to do that and yeah i think you really need to define your threat model and what you want to be protected from so that's really really must important part of the conclusion. Uh, the process take time. It was really time consuming. Uh, it spent me months of research, trying to do molds and dealing with size, etc., etc. So I'm pretty convenient that someone without any experience cannot do it uh, really, really easily. Something that's really interesting for me, at least, is uh, fingerprint technology has not really involved with time. And something that is really uncommon in our industry is it even rollback. If we take optical sensor, it was the first technology. They changed to a uh, capacitive sensor because you must have a real finger behind. It must be conductive, etc. And due to user experience, we roll back and came back to optical sensor because we don't want any frame on the device. We want to have a unique screen and have our fingerprint on it, uh, fingerprint reader on it. And it generates a rollback to a previous technology because we cannot have capacitive sensor directly included in the screen with our current level of technology. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, just one thing. Some people ask us, yeah, but why you didn't create directly the fingerprint with a printer? So it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. It's too small, too thin. It's not conductive. Uh, it will break uh, during the curing process and it's not a good way to do it. We really need to think about doing a mold and cast something to to create uh, the, the fingerprint. We don't have a magic approach. As you saw, it works on a couple of devices, but we have some device, it doesn't work really well, and some other device, it didn't work at all. So it's not an ultimate approach, uh, but I think we have pretty interesting results. Yeah, of course, from uh, the bad guy's point of view, uh, you, you can make some improvement to, to our process. Uh, maybe if we have a bigger budget, we can have access to electronic microscopes that support Micron. Uh, maybe if we can use a high precision laser engraver uh, system, we can uh, improve the whole process and uh, engrave directly the fingerprint. Uh, maybe we can have access to medical printers. So you can have a 3D printer dedicated to medical domain that create object in Micron. So they can create fake skin. So maybe the fake skin is conductive enough. I don't know. I don't have access to this kind of device, but I think it could be improved by doing that. Uh, I mentioned some size issue with um, the mold. Yeah, maybe we can make some scripting to optimize the creation and provide a high resolution image and said it's this size and this size and maybe generate the, the 3D model automatically and not as I did on, on ZBrush. So I think there is a couple of improvement, but it will increase uh, a lot uh, the cost of, 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 of doing fake uh, fingerprint. We think if you have a really motivated team and well-funded, they can do it more more efficiently than what uh, we, we did. Uh, you can find our world research on our blog post at this URL. You can ping me on Twitter. You can ping Vita on Twitter. We will be happy to, to reply to you if you are shy and don't want to ask uh, on, on, on the platform. And yeah, have fun and take care of your finger. All right, thanks so much, Paul and Vitor. That was really scary. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's concerning, but uh, it's also very interesting. So uh, we'll give uh, one or two minutes for participants to ask questions. Yeah. So in the meantime, maybe I can point out that we just released uh, 50 tickets for the conference uh, of 2021 as early bird. It's a special just for today. Well, it's actually until it's sold out. Uh, so the tickets are just for the conference since we are on the conference part, but maybe we don't know. There's a CTF coming in the next few days. So stay tuned and uh, register. It's a good way uh, to uh, to show us that you uh, you appreciate the work we're doing. Okay, I guess uh, we're kind of running out of time for the, the, the questions. You can still ask or about questions while uh, the presenters are answering. So I'll start with this, the first question. <clears throat> so some safes claim to have heartbeat detection on the fingers. Did you encounter any? Did your sleeve technique bypass it? Yeah, so we didn't try. So we basically mentioned all the device we try. So if, if it's not on the list, we, we didn't try it. But uh, it's only speculation, but I think if you use the technique of the, of the thin uh, glue layer and with a real finger behind, as it's conductive, I'm pretty sure you, you mm. will have the heartbeat also. So I didn't try, but I won't be surprised if it works on the same way as conductive. If you have a real finger and it's thin enough, it should work. But we didn't really try. Interesting. No, really no. interesting. And I'm, I guess then now that we know how these things work, people can try it. Yeah, if they have time, yes. <laughs> Vitor, do you want to add something? No, I was just going to say that none of the devices that we tr that we tried uh, said that they did that on the on the sensors. So even okay, if, it, yeah. if it's not, if they do it, it's not documented as a feature. Makes sense. So let's go with the second question. Can this be used in on-site physical security assessment? So I guess speaking about the, 
the speed to which you can implement yeah, it. Yeah, the speed is really, really, it's really long. So if you want to do it with direct collection, so if you take fingerprint of someone directly on, on plastiline or whatever, uh, you can do it really quickly. It's in, in one hour, you have a copy. If you want to do it from picture or, or biometric data, like a uh, picture from a sensor, uh, it's super long. Uh, it, it cost me uh, more than three months to, to have a correct mold by, by using yeah. picture. So yeah, it's a question of time and resource. If you have a lot of time and a lot of resource, why not? Uh, if, it, if it's something to do quickly in one week, you, it doesn't work like that. And I guess the tech is just beginning. So maybe in two years. Oh yeah, are gonna maybe definitely you, maybe some people will improve it and, and for the printers, the price decrease, the quality increase, and maybe we will be able to have crazy device in two or three years for, for a few thousand euros. I don't know. Perfect. So next question, did you consider using something like gelatine for connectivity? <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> The, but the, only the other, point uh, is, it, it must be super thin because uh, it the gelatin in this case must enter in the line of the mold, the ridge of the fingerprint, and I'm mm -hmm. not sure it will work. But uh, we didn't try. Okay, uh, another open uh, open research direction. And the last question for today: Can fingerprint data be imported from one sensor vendor to another, or is it? proprietary so th there is a, a, um, a format defined uh, to transfer inf uh, fingerprint information but the, the point here is not from one vendor to the other it, because the comparison is usually done on, on the os side because they need to store the templates so and if they follow that that format then of course they can they, they can they can pass it from one device to the other but usually the, the vendors themselves they don't store the information they actually pass that information to, to the OS that will do the templates to do the comparison afterwards. All right, perfect. So uh, another question was added. Uh, did you see the fingerprint cloning displayed in the last season of Mr. Robot? What did you think of it? Yeah, so I can <laughs> reply to this one because in yeah. fact, we, we started our research before. We made our, okay. our choice before. So he copied us, let's be clear and honest. <laughs> And, and the way he's doing it on Mr. Robot is not possible technically because they decided to take filament 3D printer because it's more mm. visual for public and they didn't take uh, resin 3D printer. And if you use filament, you cannot have a, a precision than more than 100 microns, which is too, too fat, too big. So yes, it's possible but not with the printer they, they decided to took for visual effect and makes stuff cool. All right, thank you. Uh, maybe uh, it's, it's just out of my curiosity, it's gonna be the last question uh, and it's an open-ended question. Uh, considering it's getting easier and easier to copy uh, biometric data uh, and it's not really possible to regenerate your biometric data, uh, randomized, what is the solution in the near, uh, like medium to long future uh, using biometric data like that? It's for you, Vitor. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, in, in reality, so as we said, there were some, some devices that were not able, able to defeat, right? And that comes back to, yeah. the, to, the, to how you make the comparison. Of course, if you go into the really, really compare a lot of points, a lot of dots, a lot of direction in the in the ridges. Maybe you can improve the, the security of the fingerprint. But right now, that's not definable by the user. And at the same time, it will create some kind of, um, of more false negatives. So I would say that mm -hmm. there's a lot of improvements that can be done on fingerprints, iris, face ID, and we will see how, how, how that will, will work out. But both techno all of the technologies can improve on how they make the comparison. Right. All right, thank you. Good, good answer. So that's all for us for today. Thank you very much, Paul and Vitor, and uh, we wish you a great end of day. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Stay tuned with us. Uh, in 10 minutes, we're going to have Etienne Meignier uh, talking about uh, defending human rights in the age of targeted attacks. Have a great day.